Hey, it's Jamie Moore here. I am very happy to welcome Dick Redmond, who, of course, has been the Irish senior kit man for 21 years and announced on Twitter over the last couple of days that his time as the Irish kit man is over and he's joining me now on Skype. Dick, how are you? Well, I'm very well, Jamie. Uh, a bit emotional up and down, but look, I'm very good. Yeah, I suppose, firstly, why have you finished as the Irish senior kit man? Well, it was Stephen's uh, decision He's changing a lot of the staff and he wants to bring his own man in. And I can understand that. Uh, his, he's been loyal to his own kit, man. So, look, at I've had 21 years, you know, so I, I'm very, very happy with what you're doing. Very proud. Yeah, and I know Stephen has spoken about wanting to have his own staff. Some were surprised that he's changed the kit man or kit men because, you know, you've been there for so long and you've done such a good job. So, were you surprised when he, when he told you the news? Yeah, I was, but I was half expecting it, you know. And then also... There was a bit of a relief off my shoulders because it's a huge responsibility. And when we get back up again playing football, we've got three months, nine games. It's going to be an awful lot of, you know. So in one way, I was relieved a little bit and then disappointed. But as I've said in, in all my tweets, I've had 21 years, you know, and I've loved every minute of it. And I've done my time. Yeah, and Dick, you're, you know, must be loved by all of the managers and players who you've worked with across the years. I spoke to a couple of them this morning just to try and get some some insight into what you did in the job. How would you reflect on your 21 years overall? Well, I, I, I suppose I've made made many, many friends, uh, good close friends. Uh, I've got calls last night from players, managers, you know, FEI people, everything. And I've just looked at uh, my Twitter and there's hundreds of messages and thankfully they're all nice messages you know and I'm just it's been a great time for me we've travelled all over the world you know I've met so many people and uh, you know excellent so Dick 21 years how did you become the Ireland senior kit man that was in around the year 2000 2001 time I think it was 2000 actually yeah yeah. Uh, I was manager of Whitehall Celtic as you know for 24 years and the the then CEO, Bernard O'Bourne, of the F CEO of the FEI, rang me and said, look, would you fancy being a kit man? I said, for who? He says, the 21s. I said, well, what do I do? And he said, just, just do what you've done in Whitehall Celtic. He says, look after them like babies. You know, and that was the start of it. And and then when I progressed, like 11 years ago, into the senior team, it was just so easy because all the players had come through the 21s that were there now in the, in the senior team. And it was just the... Trans to, to, to go over to the senior team has made it so easy for me. So that phrase, look after them like babies, is something that I'm sure you've uh, had to keep in your head for the years because uh, yeah. professional football players do want to be looked after. Uh, every, Jamie, everything that they want, you, uh, you're expected to have. Now, there are no, no outlandish demands, but to the simplest thing, to the most, you know, hardest thing to get, if they ask for it, you know, as a kit man, a professional kit man, you know, that has pride and everything, would have it there for them, you know. And you'd always say, no, I don't have. You'd always say, I haven't got it now, but I'll get it for you as quick as I can. You know, and that's basically what it is. When I say like babies, it just means you're minded, they're yours. You know what I mean? They're, they're your kids then, you know what I mean? And, and you just look after them, whatever they want. Yeah, Dick, I, I had the pleasure of hosting FAI Stadium TV for a few games around the 2016 Euro European campaign. And uh, I was there for the Germany game. And I actually got to do a video at around three o'clock on the afternoon of the Bosnia-Herzegovina game in the Ireland dressing room for the FAI Stadium TV. And I was amazed at the amount of stuff, apart from just their playing kit and their warm-up gear around the dressing room. You might just bring people in as to, you know, what's in the big skips and what exactly you do on match day and stuff or the day before the match day because in that dressing room there is everything they could want from food to kit to medical supplies, water, everything. Yeah. It was, it's, uh, myself and Kieran Murray set it up. He does the medical end of it with all the food and a lot. And going, when you're going at force and there's nothing in the dressing room, to walk away three hours later, it's just unbelievable uh, what Kieran puts into it. And then what kick goes into it, and we just always we have a routine that's very strict but very good. That everything, as you say, from food to, to ankle socks. There's even three types of ankle socks that the players use: one to avoid blisters, you know, one to give them comfort, all that type of thing. And everything is there for them. Everything, right down to the sluggies. <laughs> Of course, yeah. And like the number of skips, you know, sometimes after games, if we're doing interviews, you can hear the skips being dragged along, particularly even in the League of Ireland games. You see the, the kit men coming out for a League of Ireland match. 
for you guys with the Ireland yeah. senior team, like how many skips would you have, and you know what sort of stuff is in them? I'd have twenty skips full of every different type of uh, product that that Umbra would would supply or New Balance as it is now, uh, and then Kieran would have about eight twenty eight uh, skips supplying medical stuff, food, all all all, all that stuff. Uh, probably the, the, a lot of people don't realise how much is involved at that level. It, it, you know, you're stepping up once you once you go above under twenty ones. It's a new ball game. It's a different, you know, approach. It's everything. And it's the correct approach. You know, you want for nothing. That's the famous words as well. You want for nothing. You have everything there. You make sure you have plenty of stock of everything. You know, because uh, I got cut out one day, a famous one. Uh, Damien Richardson was the manager and it was the Electricity League playing against in the Aviv. I think it could have been Argentina. I'm not sure. Damien Richardson was the manager. They played Man United, Dick. Man United, okay. Rooney scored the goal, the first yes. goal in it. Is that it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I remember going training and getting off the coach. I just looked up at the sky and it just said, it says to uh, Damon, I said, Do you think it'll rain? He says, Ah, no chance. He says, Them clouds are too low. Well, the mother of all monsoons came down and I had no rain jackets. <laughs> I'd left them back in the hotel. So I had to get Pat Duffy to fly back and get them. But it just shows you, it's small little things like that. You have, Even going over to countries that are roasting, you bring your rain gear with you. You know, sometimes countries that are nice and warm, you still bring the heavy jackets because in the evening time, it might get a little bit cold. Players might want to go for a walk and they'd come in and say, I've got a heavy jacket. You know, so things like that that you don't expect to have, you have them, and that's what the twenty-eight or my twenty skips. My, I say, I say mine, my seven big lawless twenty skips. That's what they're full of. Yeah, because of course it's not just a match day. If they're in for eight or ten days in a camp, you, training sessions, they've got stuff around the hotel. So you basically have to yeah. have because they just arrive sometimes with just their boots and their toilet bag and their jeans and their hoodie, and you've got to give them that's everything it. else for the whole ten days. Yes, yeah, 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 and, and we and we work it out in a system that. They'd have four separate training kits in their bag. So they should never want for anything. You know, one in the wash, one they're wearing, and one they're waiting to come back from the wash. You know, so there's always a spare one. And that, that makes life a lot handier. But you're initially in four sets of kit all right for the same player. But it, it makes life a lot easier for kitmen if it's done like that. And and the players then appreciate it because they, they can put their hand in the bag and, and get whatever they want. And they're feeling comfortable. You know, and there's no dress code. Uh, they're, they're leisurely either in a polo short or a little t-shirt or a tracksuit top. You know, so that's the the comfort they have from it. Mick, when did you become the Ireland senior kit man? Eleven years ago, Tra- Giovanni Trapattoni. Uh, they were over in Portugal. Uh, the twenty ones were in Malaysia, and I got a call. Uh, Will I come come home? And give a hand with the senior team and I said it was John Delaney that rang me and I said I will John but I'm not going and leaving the 21s until we're finished here we were in a tournament and we were at the semi-final stage of it and uh, so when we got knocked out team were coming home I got straight off the plane and went straight in a taxi to Port Marnock I never got home I was at the been in Malaysia for three weeks and now I was heading for two weeks with the senior team uh, on a training camp in June so that was the start of it and I have to say, Trapattoni was magical. You know, the man was a legend in his own country and a legend in the world. And he was such a hero in Ireland when he took over. And it was just great. Yeah, and he's actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's him, but uh, there is a Giovanni Trapattoni Twitter account and he's been putting up tweets recently about asking people to stay safe. And like, from him to Martin O'Neill with Roy Keane on the, on the assistant coaching team, then to Mick McCarthy with Robbie Keane on the assistant coaching team, you know, people who you knew so well when they were players, Mick as well from, from his days, like to work yeah. with people like that on the staff, I'm sure it was, was, was fairly amazing. It was brilliant. It was, look, at my life in football has been filled, you know, by working with these people, people that you, you, you'd aspire to, to look up to them and, you know, and uh, even Roy, Roy was brilliant, you know, me and Roy were just great with each other. You know, a very, very funny guy, you know, but very, very professional as well. And and Mick, Mick just had a camp, you know, at a different level. It was brilliant, you know. Uh, you know, and, and Mick is a, he's, he's, he's a type of manager that rings every staff member after the camp to thank them. You know, and that's nice. You know, that's nice coming from the top man, you know. So, yeah, look at 
great managers, three three campaigns, you know, and, and three great managers. And like from each of those, do they want various things from you that might be say Trapattoni is different to O'Neill, is different to McCarthy, or is it kind of more driven by the players? And all the players over the years kind of wanted the same type of things from you. Yeah, yeah, it, we we it, we driven. It, it, it very rarely change. What he probably wanted was simplicity, and 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 giving the player and the manager when it, when Mick comes in, there's a bag in the kit room waiting for him. His initials are on it, and in it, down to his runners, he has everything, everything that he wants, and he takes it off his room and gets his laundry done every second or every day, and, and gets it back every second day. And it's just so easy for him. And but the players are exactly the same. Exactly the same, and then there's a basis that you leave the leave out for the players to come in and 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 take it and need them like a heavy jacket. You don't give a player every every player a heavy jacket, but you have them in a the bathroom and they're hanging up in the bathroom. And the player comes in, you could be down having a meal. He wants to go down to the go for a walk or something. So he comes in, just takes a jacket and off he goes. And you know, just make things life that makes life easy for them. And always have the music on in the kit room, nice low Daniel O'Donnell music that they love. Very nice. So the, the squad's announced and it's a 28-man squad or 23-man squad or whatever it might be, maybe a couple of weeks before the players come in. Talk me through kind of your work and the other people who work on the kit, which are worked with you about how you get ready from, you know, the sizes of the gear to exactly what the staff might want. So that when they come in, yeah. they've got their training sorted and you've obviously got to do the match kits. They're going to play two games, two qualifiers. Yeah. You've got to get the kits done, the pennants, everything like that. Yeah, well, well, uh, but. We we'll take it step by step. The pennant, the FAO do, so that's grand. We don't worry about that. Only make sure we take it to the stadium with us. When, when it, it, the squad is announced, it's normally about 28, but we know it's going to go down to 23, 24 uh, normally. So straight away on the PC, we look at, uh, Michelle and Mick, we look at the sizes of the, do we have the players already in so we know their sizes? If they're new players, I get the contact numbers. I remember, so funny, Troy Parrott, <laughs> and I, I text straight away I text the FBI I said I need a number Troy Parrott because I need to get his kid you can't talk to him because he's under 18 you have to go to his family his parents and I thought that was there's a professional footballer and he's not allowed to tell me the size of his gear you know it was his gas but yeah. uh, the types of thing and then you, you, you make contact with the player or, or, or the parents and you tell them look it's new balance gear Different size to Nike, say, and all that. So if you say, look, what's your size? Well, I think we're medium, blah, blah, blah. So we then, myself and Mick, get the stuff delivered. Or we, obviously, we're in touch with Malcolm uh, in Umbro, who, who's had to say was absolutely so good. You know, he's just beyond professional. He's bigger and bigger than that. He's better and better than that. So we, we tell uh, Umbro, uh, this is what, we have five new players in. So we need five new bags that we put their initials on. And then we need... 20 sets of kit for them, four for each of them. Uh, so we get that and we start initialing that. But we don't initial anything until the player tries it on because you won't believe in many players the wrong way from the time they leave the kit room to the time they get to their bedroom and the time they come back an hour later. This is too tight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we will learn a lesson on that. So let them take it away to the bedroom, uh, try it on, and then come back and say, that's it. And then Another twenty minutes later, it's all initial, and they're done then for for the duration of the of the campaign. So that and and, and then uh, it was very difficult under certain managers who wouldn't name their twenty three, and if you've got more than twenty three, you can't do the kit, the playing kit, because once you make it and badge it up and put the player's name on it, if he's not under twenty three, you have a problem, you know. So the best we got of uh, some of the managers was they'll give us 24 and you, they, they, they'll say look one out of those, one out of those two it, it won't make it and then you make a set for both of them that type of thing you know but your way for made it a little bit easier for us when the squad had to be named by midnight so the 23 had to be named by midnight you know so we're actually walking in the room the lad off Umbro again Mal he's putting names on the chairs he's in the the spare the kit room and he's waiting for this finalisation that's the 23 you know so difficult when you're travelling you know and, and Mick was great Mick would get it down to 23 as often as he could and that makes life a lot lot easier because you can travel then with the kit you're not relying on if we're in Austria and uh, you know the day before the 23 is announced and suddenly we don't have one of them the kit has to be flown over from Dublin 
you know, and everything's a risk like that, you know. So it's a there's a lot of planning into it, you know. But in fairness to Malcolm, there's an awful lot of professionalism in it. Yeah, and when you're talking about the kit room, Dick, you're actually talking about like a hotel room or an area in a hotel. It's not you're not in a massive big. You're not an Abbott Sound or you're not an Umbro. You're actually working in the hotel as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's two bedrooms joined together with a Lincoln door, you know. So we try and keep all the staff kit in one room. Remember, there's 20 skips in these rooms, you know. The trestle tables don't come into play at all. There's no room. And the players playing players kit is in the other room. Uh, and we devise a system where we use these boxes that we got out of Ikea and put the players' initials on it. And it's great. So when the laundry comes back, it just you go around with them in your hand and... AK, BF, CD, you know, all that. And the player walks in, there's his box, walks over, takes his stuff, you know, great. You know, and the players love coming into the kit room, but they'd have a little yap. And they're like me and you, Jamie. They have the same problems me and you have. It's just that, you know, they're wealthy, but they're the same people, the same problem. And they love a great yap, you know. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that, Dick, the relationship between you and the players and you know you hear often that the kit man or it might be the physio or maybe even the fitness coach has that relationship with the players that the manager and assistant manager in camp don't have and they'll have a chat with you and have a laugh with you and have a slag with you but they know as well that they need you for something serious I'm sure they can come with you and over those years 11 years with the senior team I'm sure you have many stories of of the players and and you and that relationship yeah yeah yeah, yeah they trust you yeah and that's very very important the trust issue is very important a that you'll never speak out torn you never say the wrong thing to somebody and all that. So that's very, very good. And that's, I'm proud of that because those players, you know, millionaires would still trust you, to, you know, to say, tell you something confident that you'd never say again. You know, uh, the only one that we had that we, we, we did leak out was deliberately was Michael Reddy. <laughs> he failed his driving test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the instructor told him to get out of the car and around him. And he told us this. And I said, no, you couldn't have told us that. And he said, he told a journalist. And he told a journalist in confidence. Like, that's what he said to us. He said, I told a journalist in confidence. <laughs> and it was in the paper, wasn't it? So yeah. Very, yeah. Very, very little funny things. But there's been loads of funny things. And, you know, a few serious things. And, you know, that never come out, you know, you know. And there were probably small little minor things, but serious at the time, you know. Match day minus one is something that we hear a lot, you know, in football now. And it's the day before the match. And, you know, you might go over to the away match to the stadium and the players will do training. And then the match happens the next day or the same in Dublin. You'll train in Abbottstown, play at TV or Lansdowne Road as it was. How busy are those two days for you? And what type of, of excitement and buzz would you have had building up to those big games? And as you said, arriving to an empty changing room and making it perfect for when the players arrive. Yeah, uh, well, you, you can feel the adrenaline rising inside you as, the, as it gets nearer match day. Uh, match day minus one, you've got, especially in an away game, you're going down to have a look at the stadium, uh, how you're going to set up, where you're going to set up, how you're going to get into the stadium, is there stairs, do you need you know, extra bodies, lift and skips? All those things come are planned well before the visit, or we even get there, but on the match day minus one, we tie it all down. Then you come to the match the morning, where Mick stays in the hotel and I go down and set up the dressing room. The players go for the walk. Mick looks after all that, uh, making sure they have rain jackets and I don't take them down to the stadium until uh, in the afternoon or the evening. And uh, the, the, the adrenaline is flowing because people have always texted me and said, how do you feel? I said, ah, but you have to be calm in front of the players as well. They, would, they don't want to see you stressed or, you know what I mean, uh, getting, you know, acting differently. They want to see... The Dick Graham and the Mick Lawlers that they see every day, buzzing, having a laugh, and doing it. even if you're missing something, you don't even let them know that. You just carry on and as if everything's normal, and that's half the battle as well. And then, would you go back to the hotel to come to the ground with the players on the bus, or are you there for the afternoon waiting? Yeah, for them? on the on 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 the home trip, we have our own security in the hotel, in the in the dressing room. So um, when me and Kieran set her up, we're back about an hour and a half or an hour before pre match meal. That's about the, always about the, the time scale that we have. So we travel on the bus then in with the team. On the away games, because we don't have our own security in the dressing room, I would set her up and Mick would come down then and let me go back to the hotel and get a bite to eat. And I'd come in then with the team and make it hang on in the stadium. So we've done that for years and uh, never an issue. And Mick, or uh, not Mick, you're not Mick, of course. You're Dick. Dick and Mick. Huh? I'm Dick, yeah. That's <laughs> I've it. got Dick for clarity there. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I just wanted to ask about that buzz. I, I was lucky enough at work to go to the Euros in 2012 to, to work in Poland and Ukraine and also Euro 2016 in France. And, you know, at the Games and, you know, amazing to be. We were working there, but we didn't have media accreditation for the actual matches. We couldn't cover them. So we, we actually had match tickets and we were there as fans doing the shows during the day and stuff. And like, it was incredible. And there too, the major tournament you've been to with the senior team. Um, yeah. What comes to mind when I ask you to tell me about them under a couple of different managers as well, wasn't it? Or, or no, they were both under, were they both under Martin? They were both under. Uh, no, uh, Poland, no, Poland, Poland was Trapatoni. And was 2016 yeah. was, 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 was Martin. It was Martin. Was Martin? I'm getting confused. Yeah. On. I have a I have a whiteboard in front of me, and I'm trying to look at you instead of the whiteboard. Yes, Euro 2012, Trapatoni, Euro 2016 was Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the the one that steps out, stands out, obviously has to be Robbie Brady. Yeah. You know, uh, the goal. Uh, I just said this morning, Steve Walford, who was one of the coaches under Martin, won the FA Cup with, with Arsenal. You know, smashing pro. Just said to me after the game, he says, I, I'm a long time in the game, he said, I have many highs and lows, he says, but today that's the highest I've ever had. He said, when Robbie Brady scored that goal, I mean, it's meant so much to the country, you know, and it meant so much to, to the players and the staff that day. And I had, a, I had a seven hour road trip planned after that to go back to the hotel, but uh, I, I got out of that one. <laughs> uh, but it was just an amazing, France was just amazing. Poland was a, a, a let down because we never won a game. We came back, everything was sweet, quiet, heads were down. You know, great boys going there, but, you know, we didn't get the results, didn't play well. You know, but France, we gave it everything. You know, even when we went out, you know, one nothing up against France, you know, you know, we had a chance of beating them, you know, and then they eventually bet us 2 1. But it wouldn't have been a great, would have been a great scalp. And one interesting thing about in recent years, the kit man becomes the man that holds up the board or at least hands the board yeah. to the fourth official with the numbers yeah. knocked into it, which is an interesting responsibility for you on the match day because the manager says, right, I'm bringing on Matt Doherty and I'm taking off Seamus Coleman or vice versa. Here's the numbers and then off you go. Yeah, he doesn't even give us the numbers. He tells, he says to us, what's the numbers? So okay. you have to be well tuned in. You always have a, a, a team sheet in a pocket. You know, but you, nine times out of ten, you know straight away. You know the squad numbers. You know everybody, what they're wearing. And it is, and it's nice, you know. And you always see RTE or BBC trying to look over your shoulder and you're hiding it for the crack because you, you know the pundit is going to say, I bet you take off Matt Doherty, you know what I mean? And then he suddenly gets a right and he thinks he's yeah. great, you know what I mean? Whereas I say, I'm involved and said, I must put him up wrong for the crack and just see what happens, you know. But I never did it. But uh, yeah, and it's a responsibility as well because you might give it two substitutions or three in the one go. You yeah. know, and yeah. you're, you're, you've only won board, so you pack it down, you know, so it's good. And, and it, you know, it, it was great exposure for me as well. Of course. And those Euros in 12 and 16, like, and I wanted to ask you this, apart from those two places and maybe as well, the type of places you've been able to go to with the Irish team, literally all over the world, from America, from the friendly games to Europe, to I'm sure everywhere else. What type of places did you enjoy? And were you, were you able to actually go out and see things or was it always just work? No, no. You, you, if it was always just work, you'd pack it in. You know, it's because it's, it, they're 14-hour days. And I remember when I even when I started working with Mick, because I had done 10 years of it, I, and I said to Mick, Mick, you have to close the door. You can't just be on call 14 hours a day because you'll just be shattered after a few days. Get your rest when you need it. Close the door, keep the door. You know, the players are all having it in bed. You should be like a, like a baby, but they're resting, you should be resting, you know. So that's the way I, I, I did it, and it worked well for us, you know what I mean? But we've been, we've been to Malaysia and everything, New York, you know, uh, fantastic places, all European countries, you, 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 you could, a hundred of them you could mention, you know, all fantastic. And you do try and get out, you know. You, the, there was a time when I used to love going down to have a point with the fans. You know, because they knew who you were and, you know, it was a bit of a buzz, you know, and then it, it snuck in that, you know, don't be going down there in your, your, your kip, you know, because they were, they were sending the wrong message out, you know what I mean? And which I didn't, you know, personally I didn't agree with, but look, at that's the rules, that's the rules. So that you, you lost that little bit, you know, but in, in Poland, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't in at the time and you were able to go down to the fans, the square and in Poland and have a point at night time and, have a laugh and a sing song and it was brilliant to us. It was brilliant, you know. 
Yeah, well, certainly one of my jobs at both of those Euros was to go out at different times and get some stuff from the fans and, you know, the funny stuff and the serious stuff. And I loved that too. And I'm sure for you to be able to go out and stuff was, was very, very good. Of all those places, Dick, what was the favourite place that you've been to with Ireland and why? New York. New York. Okay, why? Well, Robbie Sheehan brought us to a friend of his bar and it was called a bingo night. And it was the best night in my life and I'd say it was the best night, bar known, for most of the players. Every player that was there had an absolute brilliant night. And it was just simple bingo. But when your number was called, you had to sing a song or you had to do a dance or you had to do this and that. Do that. And this is at 7 o'clock in the evening, you know, 7 till 11, say. And I, I was amazed. To this day, I said to the players, it was the one time no one took out a camera and booted it. Because it was, you know, the players will tell you, Dick from Dublin you know, tell us a story about Dick from Dublin on that day. And it was just fantastic for everybody. It was a great, great day. And, and you know, all credit to Robbie, you know, as captain, you know, he, he set that up and brilliant it was. New York, I have to say, probably was the best. That was an Ireland played Spain in a friendly, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On on a, a, re, a newly laid pitch. It was laid about 12 hours, I think. And I was, was there, so I was there, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, and a decent crowd as well. I think they bet us 4 1, 2 not a 4 1. I think it was 4 4 nothing, I think. But, uh, in, and it was very warm, but it was a great trip, a great trip. And then we went to see the Irish uh, up in uh, uh, Swinton Beach that, that had been hit by a, the, the storm and people lost their lives and all that. But the FEI went up and we gave out hundreds of t shirts to the kids and all that. It was, all the players went up. It, it was a great day. Breezy Point, it's called. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So that's your favourite place you've been. What's your favourite stadium? And maybe don't count the Aviva or Lansdowne. Uh, well, the Aviva is the oldest world, I, I think. Anyway. Uh, well, I'll give you the, the, the hardest and, and the most fantastic. The hardest was Fulham. It has to be Fulham because the dressing room, you know, is the size of a, a, a small bedroom. It's yes. unbelievable how premiership football is played there. And that's that's the home team. The, the way team is smaller again. It's unbelievable. Like we had to put the skips in the shower area, the football, in the, everything in the shower area out of the way because the room was so small. The stadium where I'm trying to think of the name, where Trapattoni came up the steps. I, one of the Milan uh, stadiums, I think it is. We played a, a qualifier. We played Italy in it. But walking up the steps from in, onto the onto the pitch, there was about a hundred photographers waiting for. Trapatoni. And when we got up and looked across, there wasn't any on the far side. I think uh, Lippi was the manager, I think, of Italy at the time. Uh, and there wasn't a, ca- a cameraman over at the Italian, uh, Italian school up out of the ground. But that was a fantastic stadium. And then there was one where the, the pitch rolled in and out. Uh, Madonna had a concert there. I think it was Denmark. I'm not sure. But it was okay. Was, it, was one in Italy the San Siro? Stadio Olimpico? I think it was Stadio Olimpico. Okay, well, nice. Yeah. So, and you said about the change room in Fulham being so small. I'm sure some of the away games at Ireland and some of the countries, the change rooms and the facilities and all. I know I interviewed uh, Jared Dunn at the FAI coaching conference in November and he was talking about getting it set up to do the video of the match. And he was talking about some of these places, particularly one of the early qualifiers in this in, in this series of games where it was just a disaster. For you, like, what type of places were a real challenge? Well, uh, a lot of them are- you know, international dressing rooms, they're fine. But when you go to a club ground, you know, that, that is not as big as an international setup, it does get a bit tight, you know what I mean? Also, getting the stuff from A to B when you get to the ground, it, you know, can be haphazard and, you know, you're lugging around a lot, a lot of way trying to get the stuff into the dressing rooms. But nine times out of ten, everything's okay. Like, the lads that go over and pre, pre-visits, very, very, uh, uh, Barry Gleason and Bobby Ward they'd come back and they'd give you all the information they'd pictures and videos and everything and so you're sort of half know before you go this is going to be a bit tight and, and no matter how small the dressing room you've got into once Kieran Murray started walking his beds and you know tables and all that suddenly space became everywhere like you know yeah. so you know no, we've really been very good you know all over the world that we've gone and again, like you can look back on that, the happy memories and the memories where the results didn't go well, but still have the kind of knowledge in your own head of the job that you were able to do to make sure that 
from your end, and then there's the physio and the goalkeeping coach in the video, but from your end and, and Mick's end, that you try to make everything perfect for the lads, no matter where you were in the world. Yeah, no matter where you were, you, you know, you, you know, you, you make sure you brought everything with you, plus more, you know. It's, it's probably the easiest job in the world to do once you have enough kit. And you yeah. make sure, yeah, you make sure you have enough kit because you, you have to allow for every eventuality. I'll tell you a funny story on uh, Mick's, my first night working with Mick in Port Marnock and we were setting the gear out in their little lots around the wall on the floor this time uh, and the top, it was tracksuit, polo short and the top one was a t-shirt and we had set them all out, you can just imagine 25 of them around the, the wall of the, the, the bedroom uh, and Mick looked up and he's seeing all these little ants or everywhere, really flying ants. So they were all over the place and up on the ceiling. And Mick says, I'll sort that out. So he goes down and he gets this spray and he sprays them all. Right, that's it. We went to bed. Woke up the night. This is my first day, you know, right? The scene of the Woke up the next morning, we did this restroom. Every single top on the top layer was destroyed because the stuff came down and it was like a bleach. <laughs> you know, I was straight away, I want the home run. Please help me here, help me here. You know, but it was so funny. Like that first day and that happened. But yeah, uh, everything, everything after that went like a dream. <laughs> yes, and of course, that's uh, Mick Lawler, the kit man, not Mick McCarthy, the manager, of course. No, 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 no. Mick, Mick, Mick Lawler, the kit man. Yeah, yeah. Great, a great friend. 11 years traveling the world together, you know, like brothers now we are. Now, I've been trying my best to get some gossip on you, Mick, out with some of the players. I keep calling you, Mick. Your name is Dick. And uh, I asked Darren Randolph, right, because I, I, I do a bit of coaching in his academy, and he's asked me to ask you about you jumping out of skips, scaring the players, sometimes wearing just a mankini. <laughs> There's a video going around of me and Mick in a mankini uh, in Poland, uh, running down the corridor, having a race. <laughs> uh, Robbie Keane is probably more at jumping out of skips and scaring people. Uh, he's done that to a few people but I have uh, been caught by Robbie him jumping out of the skip uh, I don't think I'd fit in the skip <laughs> <laughs> uh, Darren, of course, yeah. Darren's One. a great lad you know great lad and of course we had as well which it went worldwide and viral the Superman costume at the Aviva Stadium tell me about that the, 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 I, I couldn't well first of all I couldn't believe it was videoed because we weren't I wasn't planning for that I was just planning for our own little buzz and uh I had it in France, you know, and the idea was I was going to wear it on the plane back from France and the Thierry on Rio happened and, it, we, you know, we never qualified. So I always said, I oh, would hope I'd, you know, do it. And then it happened and when the players were in, I think the president of Ireland came in and John Delaney was in and everybody was in and they were beer, cards, beer, were throwing beer at everybody. Great, you know, it was a great atmosphere. And I slipped in and got, got into it, you know, and everything in this history, you know, I came around the corner you know, screaming and I'm going to France on 60 and all that, you know, so it, it was it was an incredible time for me after that because I was brought over to Sky and down you know, to Man City where who I was a Man City fan and TV3 and it was it was great and it was just a simple thing, 30 seconds or a minute, you know, of, of a crazy thing but that's what it was, it was like that all the time in the lighter moments, you know. And like two hours before that was so serious because we we're going out to do battle here to qualify for the Euros, you know. So it just it, it, that was the two differences of the dressing room atmosphere. Dick, that's a really good one, and you know the the zone of the dressing room when the players come in from the warm up and they've got maybe ten or twelve minutes before they go back out. In comparison to after the match, if they've won or lost, but particularly if they've won. Those two moments, and you know, as you know, I manage Pat's 19s, and I love watching the players in that time when their music is on and they're just getting their socks done, getting their tape done, putting their jersey on, and they're just in that zone. For you being around the group, what was that like maybe pre match before the big games? And you can actually see the players doing their own superstitions, and as you said, about to go into battle for their country. Yeah, you, you look at you, you'd always be in the dressing room, you'd be walking around, but you'd be looking at them in the eyes, you'd be looking at catching their eye. In other words, are you okay? You know, and lots of times you'd slip by your fella and say, Are you okay for everything? Yeah, yeah, they're in their zone, you know what I mean? But some of them are, you know, they they're, they need that little smile, they need that little laugh. And I'd be doing my little dancing with the music on in the dressing room like 20 minutes before they're going out. And they'll just be laughing, you know. It's just breaking the ice of them. We're comfortable, they're comfortable. Everything around them is so professional, you know. It's just that little bit of laughter, you know, the little bit of lightness. And, uh, you know, that was a regular thing. But 
it's two different dressing rooms before the match, after the match. It's going to be totally different. And you spoke earlier on about your mood around the hotel, even, you know, before the match and then in the dressing room before the match and then after the match, if the team has won, it's great. You know, Superman, Superman story and the Euros and all, but also if the team had lost and I'm sure, you know, some of the players aren't happy, maybe the managers had a go. Your mood and, you know, you still have to get all the gear and the skips and organise things and I'm, I'm sure as well it's, an, it's important to know what tone to take around the group, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the sooner you can get back to normality, the better. Because you could have two games in three days. You know, you could be travelling away after losing the home game. So you, you thought you were going to definitely win. And suddenly you've got to, everybody's got to get their thing, morale back up again. And, off you go. and, you know, and the staff are part of that because we probably wouldn't hurt as much as a player boy or a manager. But we're still hurting. But, but you know, 24 hours later, you've got to put on that face and you've got to come down to breakfast and, you know, you're cracking a joke here and you're having a little song here, messing, you know, and the quicker you can get back to normality, the quicker the players then start to tune in and say, OK, we're another game here, you know. And, you know, that's very important, I think. For me, being on the sideline just at the tunnel when Shane Long scored that goal against Germany and then being in the crowd when Robbie Brady scored the header, two very different moments for me. You've always been on the bench or on the sideline or around it for those 11 years. What type of football moments come to mind from a positive sense in, in your head? Well, the, the, the Shane Long goal against Germany, unbelievable. And I remember walking off the pitch with Darren Randolph and I said, there any chance you catching any of them balls? He says, giving away these corners. We had to pull it off three worldly saves. Absolutely. Top corner jobs. Put them all over the bar. And, uh, and I said it to him. And he put his big size 20 glove on my head. And he says to me, I'm going to put you in goal tomorrow. He says, I'm going to smash them balls at you. Because yeah, he says, I'm just going like that, you know. But it just, you have that, you know. And then there's times when you don't get a result. You just give them the water. Like I used to love going out and giving them the Lucas Day or the water. You know, because nine times out of ten, it was a happy moment for everybody. You know, and they're hugging and everybody's hugging. And, you know, it's, it's very very rare that we had really down times on the pitch. You know, the Denmark game 5-1 was just a night that everybody wants to forget. That was a game for us to win and go to the, uh, the World Cup. That was definitely a game for us. And the fact that we went one up and up, had a great chance to go 2 nothing up, and then suddenly, bang, bang, 3-1 down and, you know, everything changes. So that was just a freak 90 minutes that Ireland had. Over a two-year campaign, was, or 18 months campaign, incredible. Even the last campaign, we lost one game. Yeah. You know, I see it, losing one game, you know, and we don't qualify, we only go to a playoff. You know, so you've got to take it and say, you know, that wasn't a bad campaign. Uh, Dick Jack Byrne says, can you tell him I said thanks for everything and he's one of the best people I've met. And just ask him how many episodes of Fair City he has watched. <laughs> we have never uh, say uh, well say hello to Jack Jack's great lad great lad very funny lad as well uh, not a great singer <laughs> but uh, I've never missed a fair city, uh, an episode of Fair City and it's my my dream to be an extra in it so if anybody out there can do that <laughs> can I walk on part in McCoy's pub that would be me that would make my life uh, no I've never missed an episode of Fair City ever there you go uh, Shawnee McGuire says you're a hero but couldn't tell any stories. Uh, no, we can't. No, Sean's not allowed. Uh, Sean, great lad. Uh, great bit of crack, Sean. Uh, what a talent. You know, unfortunately, a couple of injuries, but yeah, he, what a talent. And, and a lovely lad to boot. I think he's Kilkenny, I think, is he? He is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dick, in the background of your room there, and some people can see there's. Uh, a John O'Shea frame jersey just over your left shoulder. I know you've got loads of stuff around the house. Uh, across your years, what type of, of bits and bobs were you able to, to keep or were you given that you were able to take home or, or that maybe you gave to grandkids and kids and stuff? Because I'm sure with the people you've been around, they were all very, very nice with what they were able to give you and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, uh, I've no grandchildren, by the way. I, I would kill for a grandchild, but I haven't got one yet. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, I always brought home uh, an away short. Uh, my lad has... A wardrobe full of them. Uh, we've got them all. Ronaldo, uh, Aguero. Got them all. And, and it was great. And going up to players, Balotelli and all that, uh, getting photographs with them and all that. You know, they're great things that I have. Like, behind me is the one with Ronaldo with his arm around me because uh, I was picking up the cones and he asked me for a photograph. And 
I said, Ron, I'm just busy here. Like, you know, leave me alone. <laughs> but he insisted on it and we had to do it. Uh, yeah, things like that. It's great. And I have to say, uh, Dave, it's a Dave Murray, I think it is, our sports foil. Yes, yes. He, he captured some unbelievable shots that you don't know are getting taken of you. And they're probably the best ones ever, you know, because you're doing something else and talking to somebody else and suddenly this picture arrives on your, on your iPhone. And it's a great picture. It tells a story, you know. So, uh, yeah, I've got lots and lots of stuff, you know. It's which is great, you know, and really, and really appreciate it, you know. Yeah, I don't think, I think Dave Marr actually has his own company now, but certainly for a lot of your time with, with Ireland, he would have been the, the main photographer too. And it's nice to be able to have those photos of, of those moments when you don't, again, know they're getting taken and, you know, yeah. you're playing an important role in the team and you're not the manager and you're not the one scoring the goal, but, you know, there's still photos of you in action and I'm sure that they're nice to have and show people in that. Brilliant, like they're on the wall all over here. Like a lot of photographs that I didn't know were taken, and and sports boy was so good to give them to us for like when the kids were doing Christmas presents for me and that they trained them all up and you know great ones you know and uh, they're there for you know till I pass away and then my my kids can say well dad done all right didn't he you know what will you miss most about the job Dick? Uh, well, I don't know. We I could say. Max Day, but I won't because I'll be there. I have a yeah. box. My, my company, Superior, I reckon, have a box for the last three years in, in the Aviva. I've never been in a bar one game because I've always been on the bench. Now yeah. I don't enjoy it. You know, I don't enjoy going to the games. Uh, I, and I used to love, when I was with the 21s, going to the senior game after the 21s game, the day after. I used to love going, you know, in the stand. You know, and I looked, the higher up, the better for me because I love looking at the whole thing uh, panning out. So, Miss most, I miss the friendship, you know, miss the, you know, the, the players and the, the managers and, you know, the staff, you know, because we lived in the like, cabin fever could easily set in, but it didn't because we all had our own different traits and, you know, people would be quiet and I'd come in and burst out the door and have a laugh and, you know, I'd be quiet and they'd come in and get me and things like that. So, yeah, I'd, I'd miss the camaraderie, you know, the, the close companionship that we had. What you have over the last couple of days since you put up your tweet, Dick, had so many messages on Twitter, I'm sure phone calls and texts of emails that I'm sure have been very, very nice. Yeah, and I, 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 I thank God they were all positive, you know, and they were all like, thanks for your time, 21 years, and, you know, you, you've done well for your country, and we really appreciate it. All messages like that, and, you know, even Lark Killen this morning, you, you like sent a text, you know, wishing me all the best, and phone calls yesterday from players and managers and all that, you know, great you know it'd be different if someone said ah, thank you know thank god you're gone you know it, it wasn't that like that so I'm, I'm happy about that as well another one's come in dick from uh, the great man mr darren od not really he's a great guy loved by everyone just a character not many stories certainly not that i could tell <laughs> good old darren <laughs> darren a lovely lad another very close guy to me uh, when we were away uh, you know when we went out socializing they minded me whereas at 21's level I'm talking about where I was supposed to mind them and it was unbelievable you know so you know stories that when I write my book it'll be great <laughs> but I'll never write a book <laughs> uh, you know what a, a book called Dick the Kitman like your Twitter page would be great <laughs> <laughs> lastly Dick what does the future hold for you you're, you're still working I know you're still involved in, in football I know you've been involved in, in kind of amateur football as well and, and yeah you know, you've, you'll still have lots to do away from the international kit, man. Yeah, well, well, I'm the, I'm the second head of, of the LFA. The only second so I could never go on council with the FEI uh, because of my commitment to the senior team. So now that's that door might open. You know, I might, you know, I would like to go on council because I still feel as a legislator I have a lot to offer. Uh, I'm a rules man in here, so you know, a lot of people ring me and say can I do this and can I do that, you know, and that's good to have, you know, that knowledge. So that comes from 30 or 40 years of being in the game at, at junior level. Uh, yeah, that, that would be one of my goals, to, you know, I was, I'd be in Abbottstown every Monday and Thursday night uh, in the LFA offices there and when they're open again and then hopefully uh, I can move up the ladder uh, from them as a legislator. So yeah, look, at, and, and I'll still be doing Max Delegate as well, which I love doing. Uh, I've done the cup final last year, Rovers and, and Dundalk. Uh, what a great day, you know, what a great day for football in Ireland that day. Crowd was massive, you know, atmosphere was great, game was great, you know, even though tight on goals, uh, it was a great day, you know. I'd actually forgotten that, Dick, you were doing that, so you might just explain lastly what the, the match telling it is, because that's another role that you've had, you know, over yeah. the last little while. 
Yeah, well, uh, Max Delegate is actually, you know, it's an important role. Uh, you, you arrive at the, guy, the stadium an hour and a half before kickoff, like the referees and that. You have a little walk around the pitch. You know, you make a comment back to the FEI, the pitch is, you know, fine, uh, or pitch is poor, you know, and it's all about keeping the standards up, you know, and uh, you make sure the floodlights are all working, you make sure they're on an hour before kickoff, you make sure the fourth official is happy from the day, the time he arrives to the time he steps out of the pitch, no issues, you have a walk outside, no issues with the crowd, you're only there to observe, but you observe and you know that and you report it back, and it's to help the clubs to stay at that stage. It's all it's a European practice. It's all over FIFA as well. It's just to make sure that the game and in fairness, the League of Ireland in the last, I can say myself, five six years has grown massively. Mass. It's a product now that the FEI can sell. You know, you you, you can't get a ticket for a Bowls game. Unbelievable. You know, great Rovers, full houses. You know, Dundalk, full houses. You know, brilliant for. Freedom for football. Shells are going to be another big, big powerhouse now. You know, in, in this new, uh, in the Premiership. So, it, it, the match selling is a very, very enjoyable job to do. You know, no matter whether it's in Cork or whether it's down the road in, in Pats, obviously. You know, but the, the cup for, to get the cup final was, you know, again the ultimate as a match selling for me in, in Ireland is to get the cup final, and I finally got the cup final, and what a cup final to get. Very nice. And will we see you as a, a kit man ever again, Dick? Or are your days as oh, a kit man over yeah, 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 My cape is finally hung up. Ah, no, <laughs> like, you know, I, I've had it, you know, in 21 years. I just spoke to Don Gibbons this morning. Like For 10 years, he was like my dad. You know, he's like my dad that, that you know, looked after me. And, he, he, you know, he's just so emotional. And when I spoke to him this morning, he was just, you know, great. Good for me, but delighted for me as well. Because... He was the one that pushed me on and on as well from that Malaysia trip to say, look it, go and take it now, you know. They've offered it to you this time. Because I'd refused it twice before. You know, if they offered it to you now, we said, Dick, take it, you know. So I did. You know, so that's it. Dick My career Redmond. as a kitman is over. That's it. Well, Dick Redmond, uh, what a story. Thanks for having the chat. We were only going to talk for 20 minutes. We've done 47 because you've no, been so I interesting. I think I've got through most of the stuff on my whiteboard. Is there anything else you want to say or mention or talk about? Have we, have we covered most of it? Oh, I think I've covered everything, you know. Just I've just been a privilege and so proud to come from my White Hall Celtic background to the pinnacle and the top in, in, in the international team. And I couldn't ask for any more. And, you know, people have been very... very and in my work, it's opened up so many doors as well. You know, unbelievable. No matter where I go, somebody will say, that's Dick Redman from the FEI or the AUL. Or he's a kit man for Ireland, you know. And it just opens up so many doors. And, you know, and, and I, I, I'm so thankful for that. And I know as well, Lassie Dick, that you are disappointed. You mentioned that in your tweet, but you want to wish Stephen Kenny and the team. You're now an Irish fan and we want them all to do well now with the new staff and stuff whenever uh, the first the next game takes place with the lockdown finished and stuff. 100%. 100%. And I said in my tweet, if, if Stephen is successful, we're all successful because it just filled us down. It, it would do the country. I, you, you see the country... I just look at the Jack Terrell and errors and all that. Massive boost for the country. If we can qualify, get past Slovakia and get past Bosnia or Northern Ireland, you know, that'll be a huge boost. And to have four games in, in Dublin, I'll be there as well. I didn't get me tickets, by the way, on the UEFA portal. So I'll be looking elsewhere for the forward we want to buy. But yeah, look, it would be brilliant to have Ireland playing two games in the Viva in, in Euro 2021. It'd be, you know, fantastic. And genuinely from the heart, and I said to Stephen, you know, I hope, I wish you all the best because I'm a football fan. I'm an FEI man and I'm proud of it. You know what I mean? And I just want football in this country for all our kids and all our grandchildren that people have to have something to look forward to. And if the structure is there, you know, and we get out of this mess that we're in at the moment, you know, football can be good for everybody. You know. What a way to finish. Dick Redman, thank you so much for your time. Congrats on a great career and the best looking future. We'll speak to you again. Thank you.